Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. Who says you can't have a mid-season premiere in the fall? It's episode 388 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham. You love the fact that leverage came back not too long ago, right? Leverage Redemption on IMDb TV. And guess what? The second half of season one is available right now on IMDb TV. So I thought I'd get the gang back together to chat about it. This time, executive producers Dean Devlin and also Kate Rorick going to join me to talk about the show. And then we want to welcome back the wonderful Gina Bellman and Elise Shannon to talk about what's happening with this group. In the second half of season two, maybe some new but familiar adversaries. Maybe we got to keep our eye on Harry. I don't know. I'm going to ask all the important questions for you. Don't worry about that. Also, coming up this week, got my review of Free Guy. I know it's been out for a while, but it just hit digital. So we're going to talk Free Guy with spoilers. Also going to talk about A Tale Dark and Grim from Netflix. Also going to get some more Halloween vibes with Night of the Animated Dead from Warner Brothers home entertainment so a ton of reviews this week a ton of fun to be had and who better to start with than the crew of leverage redemption we're going to talk about the second half of season one next on the down and nerdy podcast this is jason lyles from rampage the movie and you're listening to the down and nerdy podcast Grifting for good is back that's right leverage redemption returns to imdb tv for the second half of its season, it is available now. It's available to watch for free, too, by the way. So I just had to bring back the wonderful cast, a couple of members of them anyway, and the executive producers of the show to talk about this second half of season one of Leverage Redemption. I want to start with Dean Devlin and Kate Rorick, the executive producers of the show who have been around the show, been around Leverage forever. I couldn't wait to get their insight. Let's see what they have to say. All right, Kate, Dean, how you doing? We're good. Terrific. How are you? Doing great. I mean, the first episodes have been out for a while now, the first eight. So how happy were you both with the just, I mean, incredible fan response the show received when it returned? Insanely thrilled. One of, one of our biggest worries was that are the fans going to re-embrace these characters the way that they have in the past? Or are they going to be mad at us or anything like that? But they, they just love them so much. And, and I'm so proud of how they turned out. <laughs> Leverage fans are the greatest fans in the world. And, you know, their support during the time that we weren't making leverage is why we got to make more leverage. So, you know, our 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 gratitude to them is enormous. And it definitely shows too. Now let's dump let's let's dive into this next eight these next eight episodes. We've seen it in the trailer, so it's not really a spoiler. Risk security gonna be back for the second half of this first season. How much of an impact are they gonna make this time around? Well, you're gonna have to watch and see. <laughs> <laughs> we're not we're not gonna be real good on spoilers but i, I I'll, I'll say you know we, we were so happy with the back eight episodes and uh, and this is definitely a thread that runs through them so um we, we hope people will will uh, dig it and and we'll be surprised by where it goes all right now of course no spoilers for any of the any of the the second half of the first season just in case anybody's wondering that's listening to this so the new members of the team have really settled in nicely i really love the chemistry that you guys have built with these new members it feels like they've really built a trust with one another but i don't know what it is i don't know if it's the lawyer thing or what but i i just can't quite trust harry yet so how much more are we going to learn about him in these next eight episodes you do learn more about him and i completely understand the lack of trust for lawyers but i feel like he is the character that we are bringing along towards his redemption so we're going to have to dig up some more dirt about him to get him there i'll give you that much part of the fun of leverage always is, is that each of the characters are a little more complex than we thought when we met them and the fun over the course of the seasons was learning more and more about the complexities and our two new characters are no different so i look forward to people seeing as those those reveals come out it's funny that you bring that up dean because i noticed that too i mean you've, you guys have a lot of fun on the show but there's also some really some really deep and emotional moments mixed in as well how do you kind of balance those two elements the both of you of the show but also kind of continue to add depth to, t to characters that have been established for over a decade now well the fact that they have been established for over a decade now allows us to add extra depth to them because they have grown they have changed over the course of the past 10 years they have they have become 
more who they are. So really what you're seeing is more of who these people are. One of the things that, that Kate and I talked about when we, when we started this uh, reboot was on one hand, you have people that we're meeting years later and they've, they've grown, they've evolved. But there's also this phenomenon of when, when you go back home to see your parents, how you regress, <laughs> you know. <laughs> there you go. I mean, sometimes suddenly you're, you find yourself arguing like you were when you were 15 years old when you're back at home talking to your parents. And so we thought that there, there could be a fun dynamic of them being reunited with Sophie, bringing out parts of their, their characters that they've left behind mixed with who they've changed. So that was kind of the fun for us is, is kind of rekindling who they were when we first met them and then learning who they've become in the meantime. Absolutely. Now, again, no spoilers, but I mean, you guys have got a great list of guest stars. Once again, you did in the first half of the f first season. The second half is no, no joke at all either. So forget Jeopardy. You guys have got LeVar Burton. And it's oh, yeah. probably my favorite episode of the season. I know it's the first one coming out of the box, but it's definitely my favorite one. How much fun was it to put that episode together? And why was it the perfect episode to start this second half of the season with? Well, I think you're, you're right. I mean, the, the timing of, of it is a coincidence, but yeah, having LeVar, who's always been kind of peripheral family to us anyway, because of all the uh, next generation actors who've worked on the show, uh, whether it's Jonathan Frakes or, or, uh, or Wesley Crusher <laughs> or Brent Spiner, you know, so having him was so great. But also, I think you're going to get I think people are going to be surprised by the character he plays because it's, it's a really interesting character with a fun twist to it. And it was the first episode that Beth Rescrap directed. So for us to 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 reignite the uh, R.I.Z. storyline to ha to have to kick it off with LeVar and to kick it off with Beth's episode was really special. Is there another guest, guest star that you guys are really looking forward to people seeing this season that you think they'll be surprised by as well? I'm personally really looking forward to people experiencing the episode with Joanna Cassidy in it. She was absolutely phenomenal and she came in and just and made this role her own. And I think that she was brought something to the role that I, I experienced as a fan watching it when, when I got to see it all cut together. Awesome, awesome. And I love how you guys, even though that Aldous isn't there himself, you, Hardison's presence is still very much felt on the show. How important was it for you all to kind of find those perfect moments to really work him in and, and make him still a part of this story in a way? Well, Hardison, yeah, you're right. His presence is felt as much as possible because he is a founding member of the Leverage team. And he is very much a member of... It. He, He's sort of the glue that holds everybody together. And it was it was important for us to find these moments where we could pepper him in, pepper in a little a little mention, a little bit of a little bit of Hardison here and there. But I, I feel like Brianna started to really fill fill the shoes that were left to her over the course of this back eight specifically. <laughs> and Elise is fantastic too. So I, I think that mm -hmm. that just, just folds in so, so well. All right. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to have you guys peer into your crystal ball a little bit here because I, I found myself wondering <laughs> this when I was watching these episodes. So I know other fans are going to want to know too. So we've, we know that leverage, the leverage team has expanded. They've gone international. They're legit. Mm -hmm. Now all of these different things we've heard mention of other teams in previous episodes. If given the opportunity, would you all love to do kind of a spinoff series with maybe one of those completely different teams. We've talked about this and, you know, we don't want to overexploit leverage. So we thought that we would really limit it to about 15 more spinoffs of leverage. And then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> cut, it off, cut it off at 15 shows because uh, I know that Kate doesn't work hard enough. So she, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's my play for, for 15 shows. It's fine. <laughs> But it's been fun. It's been it's been really fun imagining what these other teams around the world are doing and how they relate. And 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 we're actually going to see a, a team member from one of the other teams show up this season in the back eight. And I don't know if you know this, but there was actually a version of Leverage done in Korea. And so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we're we're playing in our Leverage universe that that is one of the spinoff teams. Interesting. Interesting. So as they say on the in the in the Twitter verse, you made it canon. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Dean, Kate, before I let you go, I know the fans really want to see this story continue with all of the characters that they love. You know, we kid about spinoffs, but mm -hmm. I won't ask you about renewal specifically, but I will ask you if you all have a plan in mind for this story continuing. Dean and I have had several conversations over the past the past couple months about what a season two knock on wood would look like. So, 
yeah, we, we we're thinking about it. Don't don't worry. We got we got we got ideas. <laughs> you know, when when the original leverage was was uh, uh, canceled many years ago, not a day went by that I didn't try to find some way to bring it back. So. <laughs> Our show is a little bit the cockroach in the nuclear war. We're, we're, we're going to survive anything. So <laughs> we'll be back somehow. Maybe it's next year. Maybe it's later. But I guarantee you there will be more leverage at some point. <laughs> well, if you're listening to this and you've got or watching it and you've got wood anywhere near you, knock on it because we want more <laughs> leverage for redemption for sure. And it's going to return on IMDb TV, IMDb TV on October the 8th. Kate Rorick, Dean Devlin, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So now we'll have to go old school and new school because I got a chance once again to talk to be the wonderful Gina Bellman who plays Sophie Devereaux and Elise Shannon who plays Brianna and find out, you know, how what's the dynamic of the team like in the second half of season one now that they've been, this new group's been together for a little bit. We'll talk about that and more with the both of them right now. The first eight episodes, which were amazing and I loved so, so much, I feel really helped kind of reestablish the original team, but also really bring in the new members of the team as well. Do you think there there was maybe a different approach, though, to these next eight episodes than there were to the first eight? I, I can honestly kind of kill that question right away because they're, they've actually been mi- mixed up. They're, they're not playing out in the order that we shot them. So any kind of cohesion is kind of a slightly accidental. But I think it's all in the writing. Like story-wise, the characters have definitely grown more confident, more comfortable. Like um, I won't speak for, for Elise, but definitely Sophie is starting to kind of feel like she's got her groove. She's getting more and more um, confident. She's feeling less reflective. But I I think that it was much more in the writing because, yeah, things moved around a little bit. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, Elise, I want to bring you in because getting to know Brianna and see her do her thing. Actually, one of my favorite parts about the first part of the season. I just love her so much already. Talk a little bit about how fans have responded to her and the reactions that you've gotten, especially from diehard leverage fans. I mean, three words. They've been great. They've been absolutely great. I'm feeling the love. I don't even have a Twitter and I feel all the Twitter love. Like it's all over Insta. People are making fan art of my face. It's like a first time for me. It's been great, man. Obviously, like people are diehard OT3 fans. And, you know, there's like pages dedicated to Sophie Devereaux, and, you know, all this stuff. But I'm just so happy that people people accepted me. That's all I wanted. So they've gone, gone above and beyond. You know, for us, it was like, you know, Brianna and, and, and Elise came in and, and we shot during the pandemic and it was like, we got it to have a, a COVID puppy. Like, you know, every, everybody um, like in the real world was getting their little puppies. And we had this incredible young actress came in, come with so vibrant, such energy. And she challenges us as well. She's not, you know, she's obviously what I find like works really well within dramatically is that I like to discover characters through characters and if we had come back just the same people like the same characters I think we would have had to work a lot harder to kind of like launch whereas having um, Mr Wilson and Brianna meeting us through their lens I think it really helps us to um, show off our characters as well I think it all worked really well. Absolutely. Very well put. Gina, for you, last time we saw Sophie, she had a bit of an emotional roller coaster. You know, we had fake Nate, as I like to call him, that was in the last uh, episode of the of, of the first half of the season anyway. Would you say that experience gave her maybe a bit of closure? Or are we still going to be seeing her dealing with the loss of Nate in these next episodes? Mm, I think that that was, you know, well spotted. I don't, I don't know if they had always put that episode in there, but I think it, it, for me, it does feel like it was a turning point for her. It was really fun to play that particular episode and to really kind of go inward because she hadn't yet. But I think it, it is, it is, seems to be like a turning point for her where um, she suddenly feels like she's processed a lot of stuff. But I think going forward, there is still a kind of softer side to her. I think she's, you know, she's less brittle than we've seen her before. She's she's kind of more open. It's she's She opens up through the season. And I think um, in the second half of the season, which you're all about to see, she starts having fun. And um, for me, that was great to be able to transition into that. 
Speaking of fun, one of my favorite things about Leverage always has been is seeing you all in the field and all these different characters you're playing when you're working when you're working these clients and things like that. Now, Elise, do you feel like Brianna's kind of getting more comfortable in the field? Because I certainly started to see that as the first part of the season went on. And Gina, do you feel like she's proven herself to the point where the team can really count on her? Because I think so. I love what Brianna's doing. She's experimenting with like walks and clothes but I love that it is experimental because um, I think that other characters can kind of enjoy that if we're all at the same level in everybody's kind of area of expertise I mean I can't do anything that Bri you know Sophie can't do anything that Brianna does I think that we all just enjoy each other but it is it is fun watching that character grow in confidence in terms of the grifting yeah and I think you know Brianna's getting more comfortable I don't think she's like any less sort of misguided I think she still has like a couple more years of being sort of like no that's not right like you know just weird weird flex but okay you know just those sort of she has many more mistakes I think left in her pocket but I do think she's becoming comfortable with giving it the good old college try you know what I mean and maybe not comfortable with the cons itself but comfortable with approaching the cons in her own way but I love when she messes up. Like, that's my favorite thing to play and the favorite thing to do. Like, I want her to mess up more. Yeah, and it has to have jeopardy. I mean, the character, there has to be jeopardy amongst, you know, us. We all have to be able to mess up somehow and yeah. pick up the pieces. Otherwise, it all happens a bit too seamlessly. Sometimes that's where the most fun happens, too, which is another thing that I really love. I actually was talking to Dean and Kate about some of the great guest stars that you guys have had so far this season did either one of you had a favorite guest star that you worked with in these next eight episodes because there's a bunch of good ones well i think we were all i've never ever i mean we've done obviously i've done a lot of um episodes from from day one of the first um incarnation i uh, but i've never seen everybody so awed by anyone as we were by lavar but and i mean that was just like being in the presence of greatness and it was it was very humbling to actually look around and think know that you were in a scene with him same that's why i had the same that was my choice <laughs> Was my pick. Yeah, we got to work with you know icons like Joanna Cassidy is an icon. Um, you know, I was such a massive Blade Runner fan, and I just loved listening to her stories. And it was such a joy to work with an actress who's still so vibrant. You know, later in life, I loved working with British actor John Fletcher, who's in um, Beth's episode, the train episode, and to work with a British actor. And we did a lot of our scenes almost like we were in the Proscenium March. Like we rehearsed them as like pieces of theatre. That was really fun. Um, we really have great, um, great fun with all the, um, all the guest stars that we have on the show. Before I let you ladies go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with a really hard question here, and I can't wait to see how you're going to answer it, because I need to know who the better hacker is, Brianna or Hardison. Let's go. Come on. Me. It's me. It's Brianna. Come on. I don't want to get, get fired. <laughs> no, I, 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 I feel like I'm um, the better hacker, but... I Brianna, feel like, like I gotta go. I gotta go old school, man. <laughs> ones and zeros, man. Give it to Alec. But like, Mecky, like mechanical engineering, all that stuff. We're going straight Brianna, and I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a good opportunity for anybody to find out for themselves. Watch all the episodes of Leverage Redemption. These next eight episodes are amazing, and they're gonna drop on IMDb TV on October the 8th and soon in the UK too as well, which is really exciting. We've got Very Gina exciting. Bellman and Elise Shannon. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thank James. You. Great to see you. Bottom line is, you know how I feel about Leverage Redemption for my interviews from before, but I'll tell you again, if, if you get a chance to watch a show like this for free and then stream an entire season, I mean, you are not going to be sorry that you watch Leverage Redemption. Whether you've seen the original or not, you're going to love this new updated version of Leverage available right now on IMDb TV. Again, thanks to the folks at Amazon and IMDb TV for letting me chat with the wonderful people of Leverage Redemption once again. Up next, going to jump into our reviews and start with the Ryan Reynolds movie Free Guy. I've finally given you my review of that one next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hey, this is Dilip Zeus from Gotham on Fox, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Might have taken us a while to level up, but we finally got there. Free Guy now available on digital everywhere. And I thought I would give time now, even though the movie's been out in theaters forever, to give my spoiler-filled review 
of the Ryan Reynolds classic. Yes, I said classic. Free guy. Because this might be my favorite video game movie ever. But the, here's the thing. It's a video game movie, but it's not a video game movie. And that it's basically a... And, and I don't even think spoof is the right word here. But it is a... It, it makes fun of a lot of multiplayer online games. And I, and I do love that. And it, I mean, it talks about... I mean, there's some Fortnite in there a little bit. You've also got some Grand Theft Auto vibes in there as well. You've got so many multiplayer game vibes. And, of course, it follows Guy, who is a non-playable character in the game, who becomes a very much non-playable character throughout the movie. And what it, what this is, really, it, it, which is interesting, is that, yes, it is a comedy. Yes, it is kind of a video game movie, but it's also a love story in a crazy way. And you don't see that coming. And you think, okay, this is going to be a love story between a non-playable character in Guy and a playable character in Molotov Girl, who's Millie in the real world, played by, played by J Jody Comer, Comer. excuse me. And it ends up not being that at all. It's the love story between Millie and Keys, who's played by Joe Keery so brilliantly. And you, you find that you're feeling that as you're going throughout this movie. So you get caught up in how fun it is. And then you realize about, I would say about halfway through, you start realizing, oh my gosh, this is actually a love story. So you can caught up and maybe you're like, oh, love story. That's stupid. Well, maybe you're not somebody who really likes love stories, but guess what? You ended up getting caught up in one anyway, and you didn't even realize it until it was too late because it was so much fun. And that was just the whole point of it. And, and there's also the whole message of, you know, you can be whoever you want to be sort of thing. So there's a lot of deep messages hidden in such a fun movie. And there's, you know, cracks about real world stuff. Like, I don't want to say political because it's very, there's stuff that's very quick. That's that makes statements, but it's in a fun way. So it's like making a statement, but at the same time, not cramming it down your throat, which I really, really love. And not only does that make Guy a very interesting character, but it also makes it, I mean, he, you, already, you already know he's fun. But then when you find out, and again, massive spoilers here, when you find out that he's actually an AI, an AI and can actually like write his own code, but not in like that dangerous war games kind of way, because we've seen that before, right? You've seen how characters can become dangerous and things like that. There's been plenty of shows and movies based on artificial intelligence that just decides it doesn't want to go away. And it takes over and it becomes dangerous. But instead, they you take it and you flip that completely around 180. And it just makes Guy a better guy. And that is so refreshing. And you see people get caught up in that, right? And that is also a really cool part about this movie is that they bring in like this the streamer aspect of, of video games right and they bring in players and things like that and people that would be interested in watching these streams and watching these games and they get caught up in the fact that guy is just a good guy and for and you and you think who would want to play that and that's exactly it maybe people would and I, I love that they play that I love that they play that off as well, and then you've got the very evil Antoine, played by Taika Waititi, and I just when he plays the bad guy, it's just so much fun. I got to be honest, when when Taika Waititi is playing the bad guy, it's amazing, and he's this you know over the top, you know lead. I don't know if he's necessarily the lead designer, but he's the owner of this of the studio that the that the game comes from. And then there, there's the other side story of the fact that he stole Millie and Keys' code for an artificially intelligent game that they were developing as well. So there, again, adds in another layer to the story and actually makes the story make sense in a completely different way. Because, yeah, this, is, this could have been a fun video game story just about an artificially intelligent character who doesn't realize he's an artificially intelligent character and then just sort of takes over and there's action and stuff blowing up and, you know, there's relationships involved and all that stuff. Could have been that, but then you add this side story and you think, well, maybe that wasn't necessary, but it not only was it necessary, it was completely interesting as well and added to the tension at the end of the movie because you're watching this fun movie and then you're thinking, okay, well, where could this go? Where's the end game here? And I'll get to end game here in a second. 
But you're thinking, what, you know, where does this end? Where, where does this go? And then you find out that not only do, and again, spoilers, hello, not only do Keys and Millie get what they have coming to them in the end, which is a good thing, all of these characters get to live on in a completely different world, which is so, so cool. So everybody gets the life that they deserve, kind of, at the end, which is an amazing thing about this movie. And then you've got the cameos, which are just incredible. Chris Evans' cameo alone, and it's really quick, really quick. But when you see how that cameo plays about and just the line that he has, given the fact that he was freaking Captain America and other things that he said in Avengers movies, it, it, it was amazing. Seeing Alex Trebek was amazing as well. And it was just, again, really quick. But, you know, given the fact that Alex Trebek's no longer with us, it was just an amazing cameo. It got brought up in there. But just seeing how everybody gets caught up in Blue Shirt Guy, right? And you see how things can become a phenomenon is is so, so cool. And it's just so... It's also very inventive. It's a way to bring the video game world in in a way that's not cheesy. It does make fun of certain things about video games like the dancing and things like that and, and bugs in games, which I think is a great thing to make fun of in a movie like this. But it also... It brings it brings out the action in such a cool way with, without a whole bunch of, like, CG. And, there's, yes, there's some CG. There has to be, right? But it brings out this, this action in a cool way, and it shows you, like, how the weapons in a game can be used in these certain situations and things like that. And the weapons that they created for this game I thought were really, really neat as well. So, I mean, overall, I had so much fun with Free Guy. And I didn't even talk about the relationship between Guy and Buddy, who's played by Lil Ray Howry. Howry. And I, I, there's just so many characters that I loved in this movie and so many characters that I had fun with, mixed around all of this great action, mixed around the sort of poking fun at things here and there, which is classic Ryan Reynolds from, from a Ryan Reynolds movie. I'd expect nothing less. And just so wonderfully acted by so many in this movie that if you haven't seen Free Guy yet, yeah, I gave you some spoilers, but I didn't give you the whole list of spoilers, okay? This is a movie you will enjoy immensely. And whether you're watching it at home or maybe you can find a theater that it's still playing in, I'm not sure if it's still in theaters or not, but I got to tell you, Free Guy, definitely worth watching at home or wherever you are. And it is definitely worth the wait if you didn't get a chance to see it in theaters when it came out in August. That's going to do it for my spoiler-filled review of Free Guy. Up next, going to keep the spoilers rolling, my review of Night of the Animated Dead from Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. We'll do that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Keiko Agena from Fox's Prodigal Son, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. It's time to revisit a classic animated style. It's my spoiler-filled review of Night of the Animated Dead from Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. For legal reasons, got to get this out of the way. Warner Brothers Home Entertainment provided me with a free copy of this Blu-ray of Night of the Animated Dead for review. All opinions are my own. And unfortunately, for the folks at Warner Brothers, they're not going to be good ones. Now, you, you're, I'm sure, familiar with the George Romero classic. If Even if you haven't seen it, you're familiar with it, right? Well... This is basically as much of a shot-for-shot remake as you can get of that movie in animated form with some new stuff mixed in. I'm not going to get bogged down too much in all of these specifics of what's new and what's not and all of these things. What I will say is this, and again, I want to preface that this, I want before I start, this is in no way a reflection of how I feel about the original where, and and you know me, if you've listened to the show long enough, you know, I am just, I'm not a fan of the zo- zombie genre. However, I have always said in plenty of conversations with people that do love the zombie genre, that if I was going to watch one, it would be night of the living dead, because I think that's how you do it. I think if you're going to do a zombie movie, if you're going to do the genre, that's how you do it. Maybe you disagree with me, but that is the standard I've always set. And I just don't feel like it's been hit. I'm sorry. 
I know that there's plenty of stuff that you love out there in the zombie genre, but we're not here to talk about my feelings about the genre. We're here to talk about my feelings of about Night of the Animated Dead, which right off the bat, and again, spoiler filled, right, by the way, you give me a new scene right off the jump, and it pretty much adds nothing to the story other than the fact that you're kicking me off with an un, with un, an, an unlikable character right off the bat, and that is Johnny, who is the brother of Barbara, who we'll see throughout the movie, and you know Barbara from the original anyway, and it, it, it just... It starts off putting a bad taste in your mouth because if the first person that dies in your movie is somebody you don't care if they die, that's probably not a good sign, right? In a movie like this, you have to make an impact. Like when you're watching Jaws, do you necessarily know the woman that goes in the water, goes for a swim, and is like one of the first victims of the shark? You don't necessarily know her, but you don't not like her, right? She doesn't give off these these unlikable vibes, but automatically Johnny is an unlikable character. So when he dies, it's like you don't care. I mean, obviously you want Barbara to get away, but at the same time, it, it adds nothing to the story. And that's exactly the point is this animated adaptation added nothing to the story. Maybe if you're a fan of the original and you just wanted to see how it would be done in animation you could enjoy this but other than that there's really not a whole lot to take from this unfortunately even the animation style is not up to the standards that have been set by Warner Brothers Home Entertainment recently especially like in the DC films I'm, I'm sure the budget wasn't huge for this and I, I'm fairly certain that what they were trying to go for was a little bit of a throwback style because this is a bit of a period piece as well. But understand that the the animation was is, was much more jerky than I would have expected. The detail just wasn't quite there. The character designs were fine. There was nothing wrong with the character designs. But just everything else about the animation just did not feel very good to me. If this movie has a bright spot... It's the voice acting. And let me tell you, the, the cast is incredible. Josh Duhamel as Harry. You've got Dulé Hill as Ben. you got James Rodé Rodriguez as Tom. Catherine Isabel, Isabel as Barbara. Katie Sackoff as Judy. And, and so many others that are part of this cast. And what they're given is basically lines that aren't incredible, but the way that they deliver them is. And they are the only saving grace for this movie because they, their portrayals are very, very good for what they're given. They're just not given a whole lot to work with. And again, does, do, does this dialogue work in a 2021 world when you're trying to update something and then the dialogue you give me doesn't feel updated? I feel like if you were going to do this, you needed to go all the way with it. Give me something that is an homage to the original, but give me something original. This is why you don't do shot for shots. Because it doesn't feel right when you do it. There already is a colorized version of this, by the way, which is something that was brought up. I've seen it in, in, other, um, in other defenses of this movie. There is a colorized version of this already, so you didn't necessarily... Need this. The other thing you didn't need, and, and maybe this is just me, and if you want to disagree with me on this, fine. They added a bit more gore to this, and I'm just not sure it was necessary. I really don't. And I understand that maybe that's part of the genre now, thanks to The Walking Dead and a couple of other things. Maybe that maybe you have to have that now to be able to enjoy it. I don't think that's what the that's not the spirit of what Night of the Living Dead was all about originally, right? It's all about fear and what it does to you sort of thing, right? At least in my opinion. Plus, it really cheapens what happens to Ben at the end of the movie. And that's the one thing I won't spoil for you, just in case you haven't seen this at all for the first time. What happens to Ben? They cheapen that by what they do with it that wasn't part of the original. Let me just put it that way. And just the added gore in general, I don't think was necessary 
because it, it's like you're trying to distract me from the fact that you're a making a shot for shot remake of this movie and b you're just not doing a very good job of it quite frankly so and and I take no pleasure in in giving you reviews like this and I'm not saying you won't like it this is my opinion okay this is something that this is the way I look at it you could feel completely differently you could watch this and say oh I remember loving the original and this just you know gives you something a little bit this gives you something a little bit different and because I love the original I love this and that's a very distinct possibility but if you loved the original, you could also hate this for the same exact reason, is what I'm trying to tell you, is that you could love the original and say what they did with this and how they presented it is not indicative of what I remember from the original and what made it great. So you could really go either way with this. And I really do feel like this is one of those things where you either love it or you hate it. There's no middle ground. I, this was one of the longest movies of my life, quite frankly. And this was a very short, short movie run time wise. But it felt like it took forever. And I almost bailed on it a few times. But I needed to be able to talk about it to you guys. So I kind of stuck through it. I'm not sure if I, if, if I were you, I would. But I'll never tell you not to watch something. I'm just telling you that my opinion, Night of the Animated Dead, is dead on arrival. And I, I would not sit through it again. Absolutely not. That's going to do it for my spoiler-filled review of Night of the Animated Dead. Whoa, we, we, need a, we need a positive vibes here. So let's go to a brand new show from Netflix. Going to give you my review of A Tale Dark and Grim, the new Netflix series. We'll talk about that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Sean Sipos from Krypton, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. You think you know the stories, but oh, there is a tale dark and grim being told on Netflix. It is a new animated series from the streamer, which is now available. And it's here's the deal. This is going to be a spoiler free review of this series. And it is TV Y7. That is the rating for this. But I got to tell you, this show which runs 10 episodes, by the way, is a lot darker than I expected. And it, it's very, it, it kind of has a, a series of unfortunate events vibe to it, the way the story's told and how it's very self-aware. And it, it's, it's, that's the one thing I think that I can really compare it to that does it justice. Now, this actually follows Hansel and Gretel they run away from home, they run away from their parents, and go on a quite crazy adventure. But I gotta tell you, again, things are a lot darker than you think. I know it says a tale dark and grim. Well, things get pretty friggin' dark and pretty friggin' grim for Hansel and Gretel. There, There's some pretty brutal scenes in this show. And what I love is that the three crows that are actually telling the story, First of all, Ronald Funches is a freaking national treasure. It seems like everything he's in, he enhances in some way, especially when it's an animated series and he lends his voice. And he lends his voice to one of these crows. And his crow is basically his job is, I don't know if you parents should be letting your kids watch this thing. Or I don't know how you kids are still watching this. Aren't you scared? Sort of thing. And, and I find myself kind of feeling the same way. In a certain sense, because there's some pretty freaking dark and gruesome stuff in the show. Now, I say gruesome. It's not like they're showing like a ton of like like blood and guts or anything. But there's some pretty extreme stuff that happens on the show that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And there's some pretty intense moments as well, even in the first couple of episodes. And seeing what happens to both Hansel and Gretel as the story unfolds is also, you know, kind of kind of tragic, kind of sad at times, too. So there's a lot of emotions running around on this show. But at the same time, it is a very enjoyable animated series. And if you're watching this with maybe your older kids, you know, maybe seven's OK. But I'm not sure that the younger kids... This is something for them because it could be a little bit scary. 
And maybe even for a little bit older kids. So if your seven-year-old is like a mature seven and can handle stuff, then this is probably okay for them. But but again, things can get pretty intense in this show pretty fast. And it, it's funny how, and the show tells you that too. Again, very much like a series of unfortunate events. Tells you that, hey, things are about to get nasty or things are about to get bad here. So just be ready for this. And yes, it, it, this does kind of throw in some themes from the Grimm's fairy tales. But what this show doesn't do is retell these tales with a different spin. It kind of does that. I mean, we have similar characters and there are similar themes and stuff that is plucked from Grimm's fairy tales. But this isn't like an anthology series of Grimm's fairy tales like you might think that it is. This is a story of its own that borrows things from these other different stories, which again, these fairy tales are a lot darker in the original version than the, you know, versions that we, we heard as kids when we were growing up. So this series definitely highlights that, but I love the fact that it's also giving us an original story set kind of in kind of sort of in the world of the Grimm's fairy tales. So this was very, this was a very unique thing that Netflix did. And the animation just happens to be gorgeous as well. It is a very well put together series. And there's a lot of witty stuff that happens here too. There's a lot of witty humor. There's times or a couple times where I definitely laughed out loud. There were a couple times where my eyes also kind of bulged out of my head sort of thing. And just this world that they've created for Hansel and Gretel and the other characters that are involved in the story is a pretty neat one, actually. And just it's also kind of a coming-of-age story, but it's a more tragic coming-of-age story than you might think, given you know what you're looking at. So, again, A Tale Dark and Grim from Netflix. Definitely worth your time if you, if you love the, that kind of balance between animation that's for kids and animation that's for adults, you'll definitely enjoy this as an adult. I can tell you that right now. If you are going to be watching this with your older kids, this is not going to be one where you're going to want to just jab a couple of pencils in your ears or something like that. This is one you'll be interested in. This is one that will give you a couple of laughs, and I think you'll even be surprised at how dark this thing really is. So go ahead, give it a shot. A Tale Dark and Grim, now streaming on Netflix. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of A Tale Dark and Grim from Netflix. Up next, we're going to jump right to the nerd news because there was a big trailer that dropped this week. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is writer Mark Miller, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Fire and blood and dragons, oh my, it's time for nerd news. And yes, we finally have a look at House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones spinoff which is going to be coming to HBO and HBO Max in 2022. That's right. This is based on, of course, the George R. R. Martin story, Fire and Blood, 200 years before the event of the Game of Thrones series that we know and love. And you could actually say the fall of the throne. Now, here's the thing. The, the teaser doesn't give us much other than looks at some of the characters and a look at a much cooler Iron Throne, too, by the way, and, and much closer to the one in the books, at least to my eyes. Anyway, it also gives us a look at a few new characters. I highlight those on down in nerdy And it's, it's basically a look at more of the members of the Valerian house, which is kind of important in this story. Right. So, yeah, we don't get a whole lot other than, you know, a, a couple of interesting fight scenes and introductions to characters in the world and such. It doesn't really give us a ton. But here's a reason to be excited about this, other than the obvious fact that the world of Game of Thrones is going to be coming back. If you have any hesitation about this, and remember, things are always going to be changed, right, from books to series. That's just going to happen regardless. However, in this particular instance, this story's already finished. This story is written. It's done. We're not waiting on any more books for this one. This story is finished. So if that should give you any sigh of relief at all, there is that, is that this is a finished story, not a, not a time where the show can get ahead of the book 
And then you have to worry about how those gaps are going to get filled when you have to end things. So this is a story that's already done. And again, that doesn't mean it's going to run a ton of seasons probably. But at the same time, at least you know there is a conclusion to be had here. Now, does that mean that they will not go beyond that? Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't mean that 100%, but at the same time, it's a good reason to, to at least not be nervous about them trying to just make stuff up as they go along, if that's what you were upset about with the final season of Game of Thrones. So, I mean, in all honesty, it looks like Game of Thrones. It feels like Game of Thrones. You've got Emma DRC and Matt Smith in this thing. And that's just a couple of reasons that I think that this one is something to really look forward to in 2022. Not a ton of other nerd news this week, but this is something that caught social media's attention. And I'll be honest, I forgot all about it. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But Hotel Transylvania 4, Transformania. Remember, they struck that deal to air it on Amazon Prime Video, skipping theaters, blah, 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 right? Well, it was supposed to come out on October the 1st, the same day as The Addams Family 2. And I remember talking about thing, talking about that at the time, thinking that was a stupid idea. And apparently, yes, it was a stupid idea. However, nobody said that they weren't going to do it. So here comes October the 1st. Nothing from Amazon, nothing from Sony Animation saying that the movie wasn't going to come out on that date. That date comes. No movie. Fans are like, what the hell? Where's this movie? And by the way, so is my seven-year-old using different language, of course. But my seven-year-old saying, hey, dad, you told me this was coming out on October the 1st. Where is it? And guess what? It wasn't there. And then several days later, and I mean like, I think it was October the 6th, they finally released the official statement that Hotel Transylvania 4 Transformania is now going to be coming to Amazon Prime Video on January the 14th, 2022. Now, again, at least it's coming out. Let's just go with that for now. That's the good news. At least it's coming out. But here's the thing. Did you not realize that people would probably notice when the movie didn't come out. Now, granted, I forgot. My kid didn't forget, but I forgot. So, I mean, innocent mistake on my part, but I also don't own the studio, and I also don't own the place where the movie's supposed to be coming out in the first place. So you'd think that if your movie wasn't going to be coming out in October like you said it was, you might have given people a heads up on that. Just a little bit. This is one of the only times I can think of where there was no heads up whatsoever and the release date just came and went and then they went, oh, yeah, yeah, we should probably tell you that that wasn't going to happen. And it seemed like there was some finger pointing involved, like Amazon Help got involved on Twitter saying, yeah, hey, studio just didn't release it on October the 1st. So is it Sony Animation that just dropped the ball on it? Was it Amazon that dropped the ball? Did nobody drop the ball and they just made this decision and didn't realize they hadn't told people. It just seems like a bit of a mess. And I'm not sure that January, January, that just seems like an odd time in the middle of January to release this movie as well. I know I talked about last week how there's a ton of stuff going on in December. I mean, even November, I think, would have been a good time to release this too. It doesn't necessarily have to be around Halloween. I think that that's, You know, would that have been nice? Sure, but I don't think it's an absolute necessity either. It just seems weird in the middle of January to release this. And if you're going to wait until January anyway, wouldn't you maybe consider a limited theatrical release? We don't know where the pandemic's going to be in January. It could be better. It could be worse. could be here forever. Who knows, right? Well, I'm not going to get into that discussion, surely. But I'm just saying, if you're going to wait until December, until January anyway, you might as well consider a limited theatrical release, right? Maybe, you know, ink is dry on this thing, but if you give Amazon some of the profits on any, like, limited theatrical release, or at least a dual release, like we've seen with many other things, then it kind of makes sense. Speaking of dual releases, I want to throw this in there really quickly. Uh, Writer Brandon Easton, he's been on the show in the past. He writes great TV, great comics. He said something on social media that I thought was really, really interesting about this dual release model. He said, you know, maybe the dual release model will actually enhance the theatrical experience for those who really want to go 
because the, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of it'll keep the people that just, you know, spend half the movie on their phone and all of these other things at home where they belong. So those of us who want to go to the movies and get that experience can have it without, you know, people that sort of can ruin movies for you. And again, I'm paraphrasing. So some of those are my words, not his. But I thought about that and I was like, you know what? That is a, that is a tremendous point for anyone who's upset about this dual release model. There are plenty of people who go to the movies because that's their only option. They don't really want to be there. And especially if they get bored with the movie, then they spend half the time, you know, texting during movies on their phone or some people are talking and, you know, people that that, you know, some some of them bring their kids to movies that they probably shouldn't be bringing their kids to. Again, no judgment from me. I'm a parent. Too, so I get it, but I, I I don't bring my kids to R-rated movies and things like that, and I'm a young kids. It's because it just doesn't make any sense, first of all. Second of all, I, I know that they're not going to be quiet. But again, not going down that rabbit hole. I'm just saying that Brandon's got a point about this. Maybe having a dual-release model is not the end of the world after all, because, I mean, look at Venom. Venom's proved that a movie can make money. Now, again, in theaters only, but that has proven it could make money. Black Widow proved that not too long ago with that dual release model. There are ways for movies to make money for everybody to be happy with the dual release model. And yes, maybe this will enhance the theatrical experience. Maybe theaters, instead of whining about it, need to realize that and, you know, capitalize on it a little bit. So, again, I think very interesting to see how much this dual release model continues in the future. I didn't know I'd be talking about not one, but two pieces of DC's Legends of Tomorrow news. But yet, here we are. And I want to start with the one that I'm the most excited about. And that is that Wentworth Miller is going to return for the 100th episode of DC's Legends of Tomorrow. This according to... Now, several outlets have taken credit for this, saying that they've learned it or confirmed it. So I'm just not going to name anybody because if everybody thinks that they did it, then nobody did it. So I'm just going to say that this was announced. Okay. The episode is going to air on October the 27th and Katie lots again, behind the camera directing. She does a fantastic job on these episodes that she directs. And it's interesting because it's going to be revisiting past seasons through the eyes of Gideon. Now remember Gideon, Amy, Amy Louise Pemberton going to be, a member of the cast in season seven in the flesh. So we're going to see Gideon outside of the computer world and in the physical world now coming up for this season. And Leonard Snart, Captain Cold going to be part of this. Maybe not the only character that we'll see, but this is one of the ones that has been confirmed for this show. So, and and it's fun. And it's funny. Phil Clemmer told uh, TV line, and this is one time I will give credit because this is something that, Phil Clemmer told them. He said the whole season is really predicated. This whole episode is really predicated on memory and Gideon's memory. And again, part of paraphrasing here, saying that Gideon's really the only one who saw everything. So who better to tell this story than Gideon? And that is a good point. There are members of this team that didn't see and hear everything, but Gideon did. So... Who better to tell this story? So I think that that's really, really cool. And of course, Legends of Tomorrow moving to Wednesday nights starting on October the 13th. That is when the new season begins. Man, it's crazy to think that these new seasons are already starting back up. That really snuck up on us, didn't it? But the other piece of DC's Legends of Tomorrow news, and if you're a Bebo fan, get excited because Bebo Saves Christmas, the holiday special, going to be happening On Wednesday, December the 1st at 8 p.m., there's going to be an encore presentation on Tuesday, December the 21st, closer to Christmas, just in case you missed the first one or want to see it again. Basically, this is going to be, there's going to be an elf who's voiced by Chris Kattan, called Sprinkles, and, and he's obsessed with efficiency, thinks that Christmas would actually run better without Santa. So Bebo and his friends actually travel to the North Pole to help discover what truly makes Christmas meaningful. And the rest is history. This just sounds like, and if you're, if you've got legends of DC's legends of tomorrow in this creative team behind this, you know, this is going to be unique. 
hilarious and just freaking off the wall. And we need more DC Marvel. We need more superhero related content during the holidays. And I think this one, this is a perfect way to sneak this in. And no, Legends fans have not forgotten about Bebo. We always want more Bebo. And now we're getting Bebo and Christmas put together. That is the best gift that I think that we could ask for. So Bebo saves Christmas, December the 1st. Mark me down. I am down. And I can't wait to see how this one's going to turn out. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, thanks to the amazing executive producers and cast of Leverage Redemption for joining me. Make sure you're watching those episodes right now on IMDb TV. So the whole first season up there now. You can also find out more from us at downandnerdypodcast.com. Follow along on social media as well at downandnerdy757 on Twitter and Instagram and at downandnerdy on Facebook. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.